Great. Thank you, David. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session on port interactions and logistics. If you could move to the second slide. Uh, I'm Tony First with Metro Analytics, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. As you can see from this slide, we've had the benefit of five prior sessions that covered an extensive review of the state of Kentucky's river ports and detailed information on goods movement to, from, through those ports from our friends at IHS Market. Ways the river ports could advance economic development for the Commonwealth were also discussed yesterday and earlier this morning, funding options to improve the physical assets of the river system and port capacity access and infrastructure were presented and discussed. For this session, we're going to hear from the port operations and shipping side of goods movement in a panel session with two seasoned professionals. Next slide. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to remind everyone of a few things to pay attention to during this session. To start, please mute your audio unless you're asking a question. Also, please leave your video off. That'll also help with your connection. Please use the chat pod to make observations, send comments, or ask questions during the panelists' remarks or during the ensuing conversation. Once our panelists have provided their remarks, we'll turn this panel into a conversation and use the input you provided in the chat pod. And of course, you'll have an opportunity at that point to unmute and ask questions. If you have any immediate reactions to what is said, you can use the reaction button in the lower right of your function bar. And lastly, you can control the view you have of the panel by choosing among the options in the upper right-hand corner. Next slide. And now to our panel. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us Mike Steenhoek, the Executive Director of the Soy Transportation Coalition. Established in 2007, the Soy Transportation Coalition is comprised of the United Soybean Board, the American Soybean Association, and 12 state soybean boards. It exists to promote the cost-effective, reliable, and competitive transportation system that serves the agricultural industry. As Executive Director, Mike's responsibilities include communicating the importance of transportation issues to soybean growers and processors, establishing and executing the organization's strategic direction, and building collaborations with other affected industries. Relevant to today's conversation, the cargo owners Mike's organization represents need a fully functioning river transportation system to move their product. Mike is a member of the U.S. Department of Commerce's Advisory Committee on Supply Chain Competitiveness, the Transportation Research Board's Committee on Inland Water Transportation, and Iowa Department of Transportation's Freight Advisory Council. Joining Mike is Amanda Coates, a commercial import manager with the Port of New Orleans. Whoa. Amanda has over 17 years of experience in global logistics and supply chain management and has been with the Port of New Orleans for a little over two years. She has extensive experience in poor operational processes, equipment management, rail and truck and intermodal logistics, terminal and vessel operations, and commercial sales. Very relevant to our conversation today, Amanda has assisted with the startup, development, and growth of new services to and from the Gulf Coast. She is working closely with regional economic development partners to align synergies for the ultimate goal of greater trade balance for the Port of New Orleans and connecting markets. Amanda previously served on the board of the Memphis World Trade Club, is currently serving on the board of the Traffic and Transportation Club of Greater New Orleans, the Green Coffee Association, and the St. Bernard Chamber of Commerce. So Haley, if you could please load Mike's presentation, I'll turn this over to him. Well, good day to everyone, and, and it's a pleasure to be with you and joining you today and, and to participate in this discussion. Um, you know, as was cited during the introduction, um, the organization I represent, which is funded by and led by farmers, uh, it was really prompted by this increased realization among these farmers that if we are successful in generating more supply of what farmers grow, and if we're successful in stimulating demand for those products, we nonetheless will not be profitable unless we have an effective connectivity between supply and demand. And that's what our modal, multimodal transportation system does. 
farmers recognize, particularly soybean farmers recognize that of all of the things that, that are planted and grown in the United States, the product, the agricultural product that is exported more than any other are soybeans. And so there truly is this financial exposure to the export market, which means there's a tremendous exposure to the quality or lack thereof of our multimodal transportation system. And so if we could proceed to the next slide, um, it just highlights that there's been this growing engagement among these farmer organizations to really promote uh, an infrastructure that really is amenable to the transportation of soybeans and, and soybean products. And that includes our rural roads and bridges, our highways and interstates, our freight rail system. And for the purposes of this discussion, very much dependent upon and intersects with our inland waterway system and our ports. Uh, if we go to the next slide, it, it really highlights, and some of you are familiar with the, the economies of scale uh, for river transportation and why it is so compelling and why we far farmers who are located more or less in the interior part of the country can be international entrepreneurs and effectively move their product to ports and then subsequently onto the international marketplace. And it is because of these modes of transportation that are very well positioned to move bulk commodities like soybeans, like agricultural products, long distances at an economical price point. And this modal comparison that you see before you really helps capture that reality and how, you know, you know, particularly the power of the inland waterway system with barge movements and our ability just to move such volume of product long distances. And it really stands in contrast to our friends in Brazil, which is the other main soybean producing country in the world where they disproportionately rely on moving soybeans long distances via truck. And that's one of the reasons why we're more competitive by and large on the international marketplace. If we want to proceed to the next slide, this, this slide really highlights um, one of the real key reasons why we are so competitive. Other nations have a, an inventory of inland waterways that are navigable that can accommodate commercial traffic. But what's quite unique about the United States is that our inland waterway system, most notably the Mississippi, the Ohio, the Illinois, the Arkansas rivers, the, to an extent the Missouri River, they penetrate into the most productive farm ground on the planet. And so you have so many of these farmers that are located in the interior part of the country where access to river transportation is simply a short drive away. And you're able to load onto barges and then down to export facilities along the lower Mississippi River. 60% of U.S. soybean exports depart from facilities along the lower Mississippi River, 57% of corn exports. So that's by far the number one launching point for both commodities. If we wanna to proceed to the next slide, because of the significance of the lower Mississippi River, and that's the 256 mile stretch of the river that starts at Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It goes past New Orleans. New Orleans is river mile 100, and then eventually empties into the Gulf of Mexico essentially mile zero. Um, because that's so important, there has been an, a longstanding effort to deepen that stretch of the river from 45 feet of depth to 50 feet of depth. And one of the things that we're very pleased to see happen is that project is actually moving forward. And we partnered with stakeholders in Louisiana to really amplify this issue. And, and the, the slide before you highlights what the impact will be on farmers, and in this case, Kentucky, but you're gonna have a similar story in other parts of the country of when this project comes to fruition and is completed, to what extent will farmers in the interior part of the country benefit financially? The map to your top highlights by color coding the prices farmers receive for a bushel of soybeans. The map at the bottom highlights once, what will that reality be once the 
deepening project occurs. Again, deepening the lower Mississippi River from 45 feet to 50 feet, you'll be able to load vessels heavier, put more revenue producing freight per vessel, approximately 500,000 additional bushels of soybeans per vessel. So going from about a 2.4 million bushels per vessel to 2.9 million bushels per vessel. And what the slide below highlights is to what extent that will benefit farmers in the form of having a better or higher price for the, for, the, for the bushels of soybeans they grow and deliver. And as you can see in the map at the top, those areas in the green or the turquoise or the blue, or even in the yellow, that reflects an area where farmers receive a higher price for the bushels of soybeans they deliver. And the reason why those areas are unique is because you are located, farmers are located near the river. You're essentially closer to the customer, but because you're closer to this maritime highway that allows you to get to eventually customers in a more cost-effective manner. So as a result, those savings are passed on to the farmer in, a, in the form of getting a higher price per bushel of soybeans that you grow and deliver. The, the, the slide at the bottom highlights what's gonna happen after the project is completed. And what you're seeing is the areas of blue expand and crowd out the areas of green. Green's crowding out the areas of yellow. Yellow crowds out orange and orange is crowding out rust, et cetera. And what that means is farmers will receive by and large a higher price for their bushel of soybeans. And we quantified that to show that 11.5, what that means is $11.5 million per year for Kentucky soybean farmers, not because demand has changed, not because supply has changed, but it's simply because our transportation system is more economical, has greater capacity, is more efficient. So it's an example of a large infrastructure project that really translates in the most local manner in a farmer's individual wallet. And that's one of the things that really excites us about this project and why we were so actively engaged in promoting it. Uh, we quantify that farmers in the United States States will experience $461 million annually. So almost a half a billion dollars every year um, just because you've made this critical supply chain more efficient. If we want to proceed to the next slide, it, it, it just highlights the, the, the success that we witnessed with this project. And so again, working with the stakeholders in Louisiana, uh, including the Army Corps of Engineers, specifically the New Orleans District, the state of Louisiana, uh, and most notably the Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development, um, working all in conjunction with one another, we were able to see this project receive formal approval earlier this year. Uh, the, the, the slide and the photo shows the signing ceremony that occurred on July 31st of this year that, that um, you know, concluded the agreement uh, between all of the key stakeholders. That's uh, the governor of Louisiana, John Bell Edwards in the middle, uh, flanked by senior leaders of the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and then that allowed the, the actual deepening work to commence on September 11th. So as, we're, as we speak, there are, there are dredges along the lower stretches of the Mississippi River, scooping up dirt and depositing it, um, making that channel more uh, deeper. Uh, the first critical phase of this project will be completed by fall of 2021, which is really important because that will open up the first 154 miles of the lower river uh, for, for, a, for, deeper, for vessels that can handle, uh, be loaded heavier and sink deeper into the water. 11 of the 14 soybean and grain export facilities are located within that first phase, that first 154 miles. So we're gonna see a real significant benefit in the very near future. And I think it's important to note as well that um, the lower Mississippi River is the number one port region in the United States in terms of volume of freight handled. Um, value of freight handled would go to a port region like uh, Los Angeles or Long Beach or New York or Savannah um, because they handle a lot of containerized cargo. But in terms of volume of freight handled, when you look at the soybeans, the grain, the petroleum products, the plastics, uh, aggregates, et cetera, uh, the, the, port, the, the southern Louisiana area is the number one port region. So going to have an impact on the entire economy when this project comes to fruition. So we're very excited about that. And certainly that's going to have an impact of, on, on uh, stakeholders within the state of Kentucky, given its proximity to the Ohio River, 
uh, to the north and the Mississippi River to the west. If you want to proceed to the next slide, uh, another project that just wanted to highlight and what we're working in, in concert with is a company called American Patriot Holdings. And the photo before you is a, is a conceptual image provided by the company of a, of a new vessel that's designed to transport containers on the inland waterway system. And uh, the question that we are asking ourselves is to what extent could farmers benefit from that on the backhaul movement once you bring in the consumer goods via container to the interior part of the country. So what this service is designed to do is come into the lower Mississippi River, transfer uh, from an ocean vessel onto these inland waterway vessels. And there's a, there's a, there's a version that would provide service along the non-lock and dam portions of the river, say to places like Memphis, Tennessee, St. Louis, Missouri, but then also there's a smaller version, a slightly smaller version that would provide service to the lock and dam, the communities that are located along the lock and dam portion of the river, uh, like a Chicago area, um, you know, like a like a Louisville, Kentucky, those kind of those kind of areas. So that that's something that we're very interested in. Um, there is a trend toward moving agricultural products via containers, including commodities like soybeans, um, bulk shipments will always be, I anticipate, the number one method of moving soybeans onto the export market. But we do think the, the, the slice of the pie chart that is labeled as containerized shipping will continue to grow. Uh, it is a, an increasing preference from our customers. And so we want to do all we can to help encourage that. And this is one particular uh, opportunity to do that. Uh, if we want to go to the next slide, we this kind of shows some of the highlights of this of this new vessel design. Uh, there's given its design, it it will provide negligible wake, which which would have a significant effect on shoreline erosion. Um, it's fast. It would provide upriver speeds of 13 miles an hour versus five miles an hour, which you see from a typical barge flotilla. Um, using liquefied natural gas as its fuel. So it has an, a favorable environmental story to tell. So there's a lot of really interesting parts about this, this concept that we're excited about and we wanna to continue to pursue. If you wanna to go to the next slide, we conducted some research that asked the question, if this becomes a reality, to what extent would soybean farmers benefit? And we, we compared it to the prevailing way of moving containerized exports, which is overwhelmingly moving it to the coast via rail and whether whereas where the containers are either loaded into the interior part of the country at the interior part of the country whether it's a say a chicago area and then it's railed to the west coast or you might have soybeans transported via covered hopper car in in a bulk mode by rail to either the east coast or the west coast and then at that point loaded onto a container we asked the question how would this service compare to that? And then uh, what would, um, how would that compare to bulk shipping as well? And there's a real kind of favorable story to tell um, with you know, the, the cost per barge for moving it by barge by bulk uh, is still the most economical. Uh, but when you look at it, it compares, and you'd expect that because there's just too much economies of scale of moving it by bulk. But when you compare it to intermodal rail, um, it has a very favorable story to tell in terms of, of price point um, in, times of, in terms of speed of delivery as well. So again, this is something that's really of, of interest to us moving, moving forward, and we look forward to continuing to, to explore it. So it's kind of an effort of trying to localize the supply chain in, in a global marketplace. And... Um, and that's something that's very exciting to us and we're looking to explore it further. So if we wanna just proceed to the next slide, I will uh, just conclude there, um, hand it over to the next presenter and I look forward to uh, the discussion and responding to any questions the group may have. Thank you. Mike, thank you so very much. Fascinating presentation. And while Haley is shifting over to Amanda's presentation, one of the questions that came in is, why are you looking at a vessel versus a barge? It seems like the power unit would be a challenge to compete with tugs. 
are we referring to just typical barge transportation or with putting it into a bulk, uh, bulk barge, or are you looking at what's called container on barge? So you're loading containers into a barge. I would imagine it'd be containers on barge. Yeah, I mean, there, there is container on barge as a service that is provided in limited areas of the country. Um, what, what concerns me about container on barge for moving bulk soybeans is that uh, number one, there's a lot of inefficiency of lashing a collection of barges together and then loading containers in that. You're really kind of taking a, um, a, a mode of transportation, a, a bulk barge, and trying to reconfigure it for container movements. And there's some real inefficiencies associated with that. And so as a result, you don't quite get those economies of scale in terms of volume of containers to, to be moved. Uh, the number two is um, barge transportation it is indeed quite slow. Um, now, if you're, if you're moving soybeans by bulk via barge, there's not transit speed is not really a big issue for us. We just want to make sure it's reliable. Um, but when you're, when you're talking about containers, there's a real strong desire among the ocean carriers who own the containers to try to get those containers back to point of origin as quickly as possible. So putting those containers on a, a, a slow mm -hmm. mode of transportation like a traditional barge, uh, that really starts challenging the economics of, of, of containerized shipping. So now you have a vessel, uh, this designed vessel, American Patriot Holdings, that it really kind of addresses some of the two uh, lingering concerns that I've had is number one, the economies of scale. So this, mm -hmm. this vessel would be able to transport uh, about 2,400 containers for their, whether what's called their liner vessel, the ones that would go say to St. Louis or Memphis, mm -hmm. the non locking down parts of the river, or 1800 containers if you're going to the lock and dam portions of the river. So all of a sudden you've got a much greater economies of scale for containerized shipping on the inland waterway system compared to container on barge. Mm -hmm. And the number two, it's, it's significantly faster. So all of a sudden you're addressing some of those concerns that the ocean carriers have as far as getting those containers back continue to have a, no, a sufficient number of turns per year. Very good, thank you. Amanda, we'd like to, you got thank your you. slide you, presentation Mike. queued up, ready to go. Yeah, yeah. hi everybody. Uh, thank you all for having me today. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the, the great push and, and all of you who have pushed for the dredging project. As Mike mentioned, it has uh, commenced and uh, will be um, completed in the fall of 2021, which is perfect timing for the Port of New Orleans because our cranes, we have four new cranes that we have ordered uh, earlier this year and they will be arriving in the summer of 2021. So we have a hundred million dollar project right now um, in construction, but uh, thank you, Mike, for the great job on the, uh, the, the encouragement of the, the dredging project. And um, as Mike mentioned, um, the dredging will, will definitely be a, a great, it'll take us to 50 feet and it'll actually get us about to 53 feet, not officially, but you know, they, they like to over dredge a little bit to kind of, you know, make it last a lot longer. So um, we do believe that that will be uh, positive for us and uh, it will allow us to continue uh, accepting 10,000 TEU vessels. Um, so just to jump into the presentation. So as you, um, and for those who haven't met me, Amanda Coates, as uh, Tony introduced me, thank you for that, Tony. Um, I am here on the commercial team for about two and a half years now and previously uh, of the container industry. So I worked for MSC for 15, 15 years and uh, worked very heavily uh, with a few of the uh, trade managers in both Geneva and New York uh, with the soybeans that would move off of the West Coast and even some out of New Orleans. So the Port of New Orleans um, is an independent political subdivision of the state of Louisiana. We have, uh, it includes over 34 miles of jurisdiction uh, with three parishes, uh, Orleans Parish, St. Bernard and Jefferson. Uh, Self-generated revenue is driven largely by cargo, that being both containerized cargo, bulk commodities and break bulk pieces, followed by our thousand acres of real estate and our cruise, which is heavily suffering during these times, 
uh, followed by our rail. So in 2018, the Port of New Orleans uh, acquired the local short line railroad, that's the New Orleans Public Belt, which connects all the class one, the six class one railroads here in New Orleans. So it just really made sense for us to take over that logistics piece with our logistics uh, expertise. It was previously owned by the city of New Orleans. So we are very happy to have now we are not only a port, we are also a rail operator. So really bringing all of those pieces of transportation together, um, you know, as we, we offer, um, we have our, our terminals, um, we're offering, you know, direct discharge to barge, um, barge to vessel, vessel to barge, uh, vessel to container. So many, many uh, opportunities there to, to move cargo. And, and we, you know, we constantly advocate for agricultural products, as we know uh, that this will continue to grow, it's something that we've we've actually kind of focused on to get a, a tenant that could potentially load, you know, directly from barge to a silo to container kind of um, scenario. So in addition to the current um, properties that we own, which are uh, four bulk and break bulk terminals and two container terminals. We are also in uh, negotiation and due diligence on a thousand acre terminal, container terminal that will be built uh, downriver um, in uh, St. Bernard Parish. So we are you know, doing our environmental studies and hope to have uh, an announcement by the end um, by the first quarter, end of the first quarter of next year. So hoping that that goes well, we are looking at five different sites. Uh, one of those uh, did not work out, so we're on to the second one. And if that doesn't work out, then we'll continue on to those sites. So very happy to, uh, to um, you know, look towards our future and growth. And, and that site particularly will have um, area for value added facilities. So, you know, looking at the soybean uh, agricultural products, we, we definitely see some value there as well, um, along with a dedicated barge berth. So container on barge is, is definitely um, one of the things that we would, you know, like to focus on. The Port of New Orleans currently has a, a, bar, a barge service that is a twice weekly service connecting Port Allen, uh, St. Louis, and um, Memphis to the New Orleans market, predominantly for containers, empties moving downriver to Port Allen, out to the resin plants, and then uh, down to New Orleans. But we can definitely see some opportunities there for agricultural products. And, and yeah, um, if you could proceed to the next slide. So this is really just, um, you know, does it, does it show the video? Will it show the video? Nope. So actually, this is a live video. I'm, I'm, oh, there you go. There's a little play button. It's just Let's saying see. cannot play. Okay. It's just the, I'll, I'll, I can send a, um, a picture. It's, it's basically just an animated uh, version by NASA of the tributaries just moving. It's, it's a great slide um, for usage of, you know, in a live situation, but um, over 500 uh, million tons of cargo are moving through the lower Mississippi. Um, and really, it doesn't even uh, scratch the surface. You know, we have a capacity that's, that's heavily underutilized, and that's the Mississippi River. We see plenty of vessels moving, but plenty more can move, and we see a lot of cargo. So we're, you know, Port Nola is, is served by a growing number of ocean carriers and barge lines. We have the regular container on barge service provided by Secor and also all of our um, ocean carriers on the containerized side. So we have three global alliances um, and 13 weekly services, two Europe, um, three Europe, two Med, two Asia, um, two Caribbean, two Central America, and two East Coast South America services. So those services are growing. Um, you know, this year has been a bit of a challenge, of course, with everything, um, with every industry, uh, with transportation, it's definitely a challenge, but we do see some growth uh, in construction materials and things like that. So, and proceed to the next slide. 
Give me one moment. Thank no problem. Haley, Haley had one uh, had an issue, so I'm going to pick up uh, where we left off here. So give me two seconds, if you would. I will send a link to the video, Barry. Thank you. So we definitely see the value of moving cargo by barge and, um, you know, down to New Orleans and have transloaded into containers. We know that the containerized market will continue to grow and our growing services to, um, you know, to Asia, we previously didn't have those services. And uh, 2017 brought our first Asia direct service, followed by 2019, the second one. And we do have uh, we do have more carriers looking at bringing new services. I'm just going to check the chat. Transloading containers with bulk products. So we do our terminal operators do offer um, bulk transload from barge, rail, um, and hopper. You know, um, hopper cars uh, to. Uh, to uh, containers. Um, we also have an off dock facility. They are currently loading rice from barge to a conveyor and then into directly into containers. So um, we see that that as a growing growing opportunity. This is our container on barge uh, service. Let me just get my here. So um, barge and, um, you know, inland waterways really play a vital role in many of the commodities that are moving already through the port of New Orleans. The container on barge is, again, predominantly for the uh, resin shippers, but there's no reason why we couldn't see agricultural products moving. We see larger container ships, um, which will ultimately lead to larger bulk vessels, which become, you know, uh, a barge system and that becomes more efficient for steel and metals to move northbound matching back with agricultural products southbound. So we, we see those opportunities uh, in barge that can grow in the future. So 28,000 TEUs moved last year by barge. That is, that is only growing. Um, you know, CCOR brought the service in and you know, is really a driver of CMA and, you know, they're a pioneer in the industry in terms of innovating new services and, and ways of moving cargo. Uh, we see that they're, you know, working with um, Air Ocean and uh, their logistics arm. So we see the, the most innovation from CMA in terms of new services, new ideas. They're really willing to be uh, the pioneers in the industry. And, um, you know, CCOR and uh, CMA teamed up a few carriers. There's a few more carriers that are now on board, uh, but it does connect St. Louis as well. And there's no reason why we couldn't see that into other tributaries. You can, the next slide. Thank you. So even though we're discussing uh, inland waterways, I have to mention our rail connectivity, you know, the Port of New Orleans is the only deep water port in the United States served by six class one railroads. And, um, you know, the BNSF, CN, CSX, KCS, NS, and UP, that really strategically gives us an advantage over some of the other ports. And, and in, in, in discussions of um, soy and uh, agricultural products, we, we see that that connection really by rail is, is vital um, in transloading or whether it's by barge, by rail, into container, we definitely see some opportunities there. Our intermodal services, just to mention those, our intermodal services, we have uh, the KCS that is twice weekly, that is to and from the Dallas area. And then daily, we have connections to Memphis, Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, Columbus, um, and those are intermodal. And then obviously, you see the rail network in front of you. Um, that is, you know, endless opportunities there through the other rail carriers that are, you know, rail cars or domestic moves. So we, we um, you know, thank our, our rail partners for the dedication to our market, and we see a lot of cargo continuing to move. 
And I think that is the last slide, but if you'll go to the next slide, it looks like the last one. Short and sweet. Thank you, Amanda, very much appreciated. But I do wanna um, open up the, the floor for, you know, questions, um, really an in, in open open kind of discussion. You know, I, I, I did keep the, the, uh, the slideshow very short and sweet. You guys know that the Port of New Orleans is here where we're located, what we do, and if there's anything that we can do for you to give you additional information, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and we invite you to the Port of New Orleans. We'd love to give you a tour at any given moment uh, to show you what, what we have to offer. Thank you. Very good. Uh, we're going to open up now exactly as you asked, Amanda, to Q&A from everybody. We'll go ahead and take a look at the chat pod. Uh, and as people are queuing themselves up, a question, this, this has really shown the importance of the connectivity of the river system to, to the Kentucky ports. So both of you, Mike, Amanda, what do you think are the most pressing challenges to effective and efficient goods movement on the river system? I mean, you talked about moving containers on barges in the non-lock portion of the river system to get them up there. What would it take to be able to, to extend that service into the lock portion? What, what would have to happen in order to make that a reality? Well, I think the, the lock and dam system is uh, really the critical connector uh, and, and major infrastructure investments would have to happen. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the it doesn't clearly exist today. Of uh, the 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 concept that I had shared, and again, this is, you know, the, at best it would be two years away from this service, this American Patriot Holding service, becoming a reality. They do have a vessel designed for the lock and dam portion of the river. It's you know, both vessels. What are what's called the liner vessel. Mm -hmm. which would provide that service to the non lock and dam portion of the river and what they call their hybrid vessel vessel they're both 595 feet long uh the liner vessel the liner vessel the bigger vessels uh, i believe is 134 feet wide so that's too wide for the locks for the locks and dams which are the locks are 110 feet wide but the hybrid vessel is 100 feet wide so that was, it's designed to go through the lock and dam portions of the river. And again, that hybrid vessel, the smaller vessel would accommodate 17 to 18, 1800 containers. So all of a sudden you're, you're making it accessible to a Joliet, Illinois, a Louisville, Kentucky, um, you know, even a possibly further up north on, along the Mississippi River. We'll see, and that's, again, that's something that's exciting to us. Um, and we'll, we'll hopefully that'll happen. But I think the broader issue is very germane about trans transportation and you know more comprehensively along the inland waterway system, and what kind of investments are necessary, whether it's for containerized shipping or for just traditional bulk shipping. And it, it really, I think, comes to having robust robust levels of funding for the inland waterway system. But I think something else we need to underscore is it's not just the size of the check that the federal government writes, it's also providing predictability of that funding. And we saw, a, I think, a very compelling example of what can happen when you provide predictability of, predictability of funding. Uh, just this summer, started in early July, and it just concluded a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. is we did, we as a country, uh, conducted by the Army Corps of Engineers, um, did major rehabilitation work on five of the eight locks and dams on the Illinois River, including <clears throat> a couple of them that were truly the poster child for a undercapitalized, poorly maintained lock and dam. And they were able to commence work on that, do it all simultaneously, Simultaneously, so these were five of the eight locks that were that are closest to the Mississippi River, the furthest south uh, locks and dams, and they were able to start it in early July. Did it all simultaneously, and they were all completed by by the end of October of this year. And so, one of the, I think one of the messages that I try to underscore to the Corps of Engineers, but I think even more importantly to Congress, is that 
when you Congress provide predictability of funding and clarity of mission, those two things, and that's what Congress does or doesn't do, but when they do that, you can actually get exceptional work done. But when, but when Congress provides a lack of predict, a lack of clarity, and the and and unpredictable funding, they're asking these government agencies to operate amidst um, uncertainty and ambiguity, and they have a really hard time doing that. And that's when you start seeing these cost overruns for these projects, these project delays. And I think that's something that we really need to keep underscoring as we interface with our elected officials when it comes to having a well-maintained, well-capitalized inland waterway system that also includes our ports. <clears throat> uh, one of the questions from the chat pod, uh, this one, Amanda, I would imagine is to you, are new liner routes in the Gulf from Zim, CMA, CGM driving this growth in bulk containerization? We do see, um, we do see uh, new services that are driving more bulk containerized cargos, um, not specifically from Zim or CMA, but um, would say mainly from all carriers. Uh, we, we're seeing, you know, a lot more rice and it's, it's really going into uh, the Middle East Red Sea area. So, um, you know, Dimam, Saudi Arabia, we see this, this growth in, in rice that's being uh, transloaded here as opposed to in other ports. So um, not necessarily the, the services, but it doesn't hurt that there are direct connections to Asia now through the Panama Canal as where in the past there were not. And, and these vessels are are sizable vessels uh, to start a service. Um, they're 6,500 to uh, 8,500 TEU vessels. So we, um, we are seeing a growth and that is why we are so focused on, uh, you know, our project with a downriver terminal uh, because we know that we are restricted here by a bridge of 10,000 TEUs. Um, and we, we, we will definitely see more growth in services uh, as mentioned, we have more carriers that are looking at, at direct services to Asia, to India, and um, with our global connections there already, it really just makes, you know, more sense. Um, I was looking at, uh, I had another, I saw another question, but go ahead, I'll take one question at a time. And this one then potentially back to, to Mike. Could farmers realistically fill containers in the field and transport them to the port rather than by grain trucks to grain storage and then have the grain storage fill the, the containers? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's kind of, you know, ultimately, you know, if you were to write a script, you would have something like that because, um, you know, clearly we have a very good relationship with the, the, the agricultural shippers, including the large ones, they're, they've been integral to our success as farmers. But I make no apology that it should mm -hmm. always be my aspiration to try to remove the number of steps between a farmer growing soybeans and the ultimate consumption of those soybeans or a product derived from ingesting those soybeans, mm -hmm. uh, like, a, like a piece of meat. Um, and so that's something that you know, really excites us. You know, today, this is more in the what's called the identity preserve kind of portfolio for like soybeans, say soybeans that are grown for the purposes of, say, tofu production in Japan. So where there's higher cleaning requirements, higher um, handling kind of requirements. But this happens today where farmers are growing these type of soybeans under specific type of contract with certain specifications for growing and handling. And then they're driven a, a short distance to a, a facility where they're cleaned and then they're bagged, put on pallets and then put into a container. And then um, whether driven to a rail yard, uh, that's what would be most common. Um, so that certainly is, is possible. And, and um, you know, that's again, that's something that we're wanting to continue to, to explore because when, you, when you're removing those kind of steps between the farmer and the con consumer, that mean that will translate into farmers realizing a higher market value for the soybeans that they produce. Yeah, less transaction costs all the way around. So 
this one also might, since we're on this topic, are the major grain companies on board with containerized grain? I mean, I, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're still mostly a, a, a bulk mode, but there are examples of these larger companies, Archer Daniels Midland, for example, they load containers mm -hmm. um, at their facility in Decatur, Illinois, where the originally ADM uh, was, was, was established. Um, so that there is examples of that, you know, most of the larger players in moving uh, soybean exports via container are companies like Schooler or DeLong or some of the smaller ones that are more, again, for that identity preserved kind of model. Um, and so, but, you know, I, I, again, one of the things that I, I, one of these, one of the things these larger companies are all, you know, recognizing, and I just saw you know, a public announcement from Archer Daniels Midland about their five leading food trends in the future that, that they think will impact, you know, global food consumption. And one of the, one of those five was, was traceability. And, and so one of the things that challenges that is, you know, we in agriculture have a supply chain that's based on multiple steps of consolidation and aggregation. That's the traditional mm -hmm. way of moving soybeans on the export market. So you've got farm to elevator consolidation point number one, elevator to barge loading facility consolidation point number two, barge to ocean vessel loading step number mm -hmm. three. That makes it really hard to, to trace where those soybeans ultimately came from. So a, a, an ocean vessel of soybeans loaded it in the lower Mississippi River could be from Ohio, they could be from Kentucky, from Iowa, mm -hmm. from Minnesota, Missouri, anywhere. And whereas with containers, you, uh, you are able to provide more of that traceability. So as these trends continue, um, being able to have that kind of traceability, and I don't think traceability is a, is a, is a fad. I think that's, that's gonna be with us for the foreseeable future. All these larger companies are all recognizing that and so I, I think there's an increasing openness to making sure that, that that supply chain is really compatible with that goal. Interesting, interesting dynamic. So Amanda, since you've been involved in a lot of startups and developments, if, if you were a river port and you were interested in containerized um, movements, what kind of infrastructure would you have to put in place in order to be able to accommodate you know, a container full of grain, which what I would imagine would be a rather heavy um, critter. Definitely. <laughs> a great question. Uh, well, you would need a port. You would need a, mm -hmm. a you know, a, a landing place, um, a, a yard for empties, uh, chassis, uh, unless, of course, the, 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 the product could be delivered directly there and transloaded. That would be the idea scenario would be to have a, um, you know, a transloading facility along the river that could ac accept in uh, the cargo and then uh, transload and then into container. Uh, container crane obviously would be necessarily necessary. So uh, pretty big investment there. So Mike, getting back to the, the idea of, of filling a container at a farm and then moving into the port what would a fully loaded 40 foot container of soybeans weigh? Because you've got an 80,000 pound weight limit on the, on the, rail, on the road system. Um, and I doubt you're gonna get a permit. Uh, that's a divisible load. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you're able to bring up one of my, my, my slides. If not, that's not, a, that's not a problem. But that's one of the considerations that, that we had oh. to look at is that, I mean, if you're, if you're loading soybeans in a container at or near a farm and then then you have to transport it by by truck then you are going to be subject to those road weight limits and you know you can easily have a of a, a container so most consumer goods a container full of consumer goods nike shoes or electronics mm -hmm. or clothes you're looking at 12 13 metric tons and if someone wants to go to the i believe it's the second to the last slide um that's going to, you're going to have a look at about 12 to 13 metric tons where um, that at the very bottom bullet point there. So you're looking at, so for, if you have like road weight limits, if you're subject to oh, that, you then you're looking at that 636 bushels or 17 metric tons. If you're able to, you know, as Amanda talked about, if you're at a, if you say you have a transloading facility near 
a port or an, an inland waterway port included, then all of a sudden you're you're able to avoid those those weight limits, and so you're able to get more of an 800 bushel, 21, 22 metric ton weight limit, and so that's um that's something to you know to take into consideration. So um, of course you always have to think about <clears throat> what are the weight limits of the of the destination. Um, and, and so what about the road weight limit? So what's going to happen to that container once it gets offloaded at some port in Vietnam or Indonesia? So that's obviously something to take into consideration. Very good. Um, I guess this is both for Amanda and Mike. What port metrics are the most relevant from your perspective? You know, given, given the fact that a number of ports are reasonably close in proximity to one another, particularly on the river system in, in Kentucky, they are all kind of lined up along the river system. What features would you look for to support grain commodity movements or container and barge movements from a port? Okay. Um, connectivity would be one. And then con proximity to consumer market, because you want those imported containers there. And, and you know, Imports don't necessarily work for barge northbound. Um, you know, we've tried it here in New Orleans with um, some of the retail um, the retail customers. William Sonoma was was one of the first to try a container on barge, and it was it was a bit uh, it was cost prohibitive as well as uh, transit time um, prohibitive. It just did not work. But um, really having that consumer market, maybe you have the availability of empties through a truck or rail entering into a port, and then you have, you know, the connectivity to, um, you know, New Orleans by, by barge, container on barge, whichever it may be. Um, but really geographically, you know, it, it all has to make sense. Um, and I think where, where the river system really works is Central and South America um, connections because those transit times are so low and the costs are so low. And we have so much uh, coffee coming into the United States from those areas already. Um, so we see an abundance of empties there, empty 20s. But in terms of 40s, I mean, it's really interesting to think about, um, you know, something that we've done in Dallas that really works for us is um, we use their empties uh, from their consumer market of consumer goods, uh, retail products. Those empties are brought to New Orleans for resin. So something along that concept would, would definitely work at a location along the river. So the, the question was about the, the port metrics that are really of, of consequence to our industry. And I, I guess the one that quickly comes to mind is the Achilles heel for any supply chain or any participant in the supply chain is a lack of predictability or reliability. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the easiest ways of, of killing your relationship with your customers is if you have a supply chain that's not predictable or reliable, it's more important than cost. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we see, um, you know, unfortunately that happens all too often with our friends on the West Coast this is mainly related to containers is mm -hmm. when you have a disruption of service and it's more than just some of sometimes the periodic work stoppages or, or friction it's sometimes just the unexpected dwell time um, that can that can happen and so um, we can handle you know not unlimited cost escalations because that's very important but when you're all of a sudden in the business of not able to provide that product in a reliable fashion, that can really have major consequences on your competitiveness. Go, yeah, ahead, I think that, go ahead, David. Sorry, I, I know there was a, I think Greg had a question from the audience. Okay. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Amanda, the question's for you with respect to Kentucky ports making introductions or getting to network with uh, the uh, New Orleans and all the logistic networks in, in uh, New Orleans. How, 
how might that be able to be facilitated? We'd be, we would be happy to facilitate any uh, connections that uh, Kentucky River Ports may need, um, you know, whether that's through uh, our existing terminal operators or some of the um, private facilities that are located along the river. We, you know, we have, have great connections and we would, we would be happy to make those connections for you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are closing in on the, um, the end time, but I got one more question. And this is again, both to Amanda and to Mike. Um, what could government at the national, state, or local level do to improve the efficiency of goods movement on the river system? And the answer can span the spectrum from policy to removing or creating regulations to funding. Open field running. Okay, so I think that the, 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 uh, the current system works. Um, it, 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 the current system that we have in place works well. But um, further incentivizing the startup to uh, utilizing waterway, um, waterway transportation, I think would be the greatest, uh, greatest promotion that, that, we could, that we could have. Um, we have, you know, the capacity of the river and it's heavily underutilized. Um, and while waterways might not be as transit time sensitive, the the potential for the growth in volume is massive. Um, I think that we will certainly continue to see a focus on environmental friendly, uh, you know, ways of transportation, reducing the carbon footprint. And if the president elect uh, holds up, we will we will definitely see some gains in that sector. Um, we don't need to reinvent what is currently happening. We really just need to use the resources that we already have. Um, insisting on innovation and, um, you know, having the exporters really revisit their global, their global networks and logistics plan um, and really minimizing the risk through port diversification and also our economic development partners. We really need our economic development partners to see the benefits of uh, inland waterways and have some incentives on those startup costs because there are heavy infrastructure costs and uh, startup costs that, that may be um, discouraging. So I think that having the, the government behind those uh, incentives would be, would be beneficial. Thank you. And quickly, I think just maintaining, you know, robust funding for our ports and, you know, we've made some real progress as of late on an issue related to, to port maintenance uh, called the, the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund and making sure that that, that revenue stream is allocated as intended uh, to mm -hmm. the ports that need to have maintenance dredging and, and, uh, and, and um, you know, that kind of work. Uh, Southern Louisiana, the Lower Mississippi River is really, is one of those key areas that it's a beneficiary of that. We wanna mm -hmm. keep that going. And, and particularly when we have a new administration, a new Congress, we, we don't want that to get we don't want to take a step backward on that issue. And then also, I, I think back to an earlier point of just making sure that we've got more predictable funding. Um, you know, we try to, we try to invest in these multi-year, very expensive capital projects via one-year appropriations measures. That's a recipe for cost escalation and project delay. And I would much rather see a, a scenario where we're providing multiple years of funding commitment, like a state department of transportation does. Every state department tr of transportation that I know of has a five-year investment plan. And with the expiration of a year, they add another year to it. So they always have five years ahead. Our, our federal government doesn't do it that way. We need to provide more of a predictable long-term revenue forecast for these capital projects, including the inland waterway system, including our ports, if we're really trying to make the taxpayer dollar stretch further and get some of these needed projects executed and completed. Beautiful. Amanda, Mike, thank you so much. It was thank a wonderful panel conversation. Me. You guys thank did you. great. Really, really appreciate it. Um, thank, thank you, you so, so much. very much. So everybody, um, thank you for attending. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, and we have the closing session coming up in an hour.
So again, thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Take good care and be safe. Thank you.